Say you look up and see this airplane. How does it make such beautiful clouds? Well, let's think of it like this. Here we have a cross-sectional piece of an airplane wing, and in front of it are millions of tiny air particles. As the wing moves forward, it pushes through the particles. All of the air particles above the wing will move over the wing, while the rest will move underneath. The air particles moving over will have to move faster than those on the bottom because they have to cover a larger distance in the same amount of time. Therefore, there is a high velocity on the top and a low velocity on the bottom. Through Bernoulli's principle, we know that velocity is proportional to the inverse of pressure. Therefore, there is a low pressure on the top and a high pressure on the bottom. This pressure pushes up on the wing, causing lift. But wait, then how can an airplane fly upside down? That means that there would be a low pressure on the bottom and a high pressure on the top, pushing the airplane down. This theory is called the equal transit time theory because it assumes that all of the air particles take the same amount of time to cross over the wing. Let's try a different method that makes more sense. An airplane has the most lift when it takes off, so let's model our cross section after that. The air particles will still move over and under the wings as previously described, but this time you will notice something different happening. The air particles on the bottom will be pushed down and compressed together by the tail of the wing, which causes a higher pressure. The air particles on the top are given more room because the air particles under the wing have been moved out of the way, which causes a lower pressure. You will also notice that most all of the air particles are being pushed downward, and because of Newton's third law, we know that there must be an equal and opposite reaction to this downward motion, and that reaction is lift. But what if the plane is flying upside down? Well, as long as the nose of the plane is still pointed up, the air particles will still be affected in the same way. Okay, so let's get back to our original question. Here we have the front view of an airplane. Since there is a high pressure on the bottom of the wing and a low pressure on the top, there are going to be many air particles on the bottom and only a few on the top. The particles on the bottom start to feel a little claustrophobic and want to move to the top of the wing, where there is more room. As more and more particles move up and the plane moves forward, the particles create a spiral behind the tips of each wing called a vortex. But how can we measure the vorticity or the spiraliness of the vortex? First, we have to create a function that represents the vortex, and then we have to find the curl of that vortex. We can take the curl of this function that represents the path taken by an air particle in the vortex by finding the cross product of the gradient and the function. If the vorticity is large, it will look like this. If the vorticity is small, it will look like this. If the vorticity is equal to zero, there will be no vortex. So why is this important? A vortex interrupts the airflow and causes drag. So we need to minimize the vorticity as much as possible. But how can we do this? Let's go back to our frontal view of an airplane. A vortex is born when the air particles under the wing move to the top. So what if we placed a barrier on the end of the wing called a winglet? Obviously, air can still pass over the barrier, but not as much as before. This decrease in vorticity causes a decrease in drag and in fuel, saving airplane owners lots of money. However, this airplane does not have any winglets, allowing the existence of these large, beautiful vortices. 